So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, members of Chatham House, guests, friends, um, and all of those joining us today, I'm Robin Niblett, the director of Chatham House. And I'm absolutely thrilled to have with us today as part of our Digital Society Initiative, uh, an initiative we set up at Chatham House about a year ago as part of our second century, which for those of you who know Chatham House will know, uh, is starting in 21. 2020 is 100 years of Chatham House uh, since we were first founded. Um, and our Digital Society Initiative is a bit about how we think of our engagement for the future. What are the opportunities, in many cases, the technology can help deliver to build a better world in the future, and not just the risks and negatives. People spend a lot of time talking about the negatives of technology. Um, we want to be as alive at Chatham House to the opportunities for technology to drive uh, progress, especially in public policy and in democracy. Uh, and for that reason, I am absolutely thrilled that we have with us today, Audrey Tang. Uh, Audrey Tang, welcome to this interview, which we're recording. But Audrey, great to have you with us. Hi, very happy to be here and have a good local time, everyone. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, as this is a recorded interview, um, I'm trying to think. It's quite late in the evening in your time, I suspect. It's still uh, in our context on the 17th of June, uh, relatively early in the morning. But uh, Audrey is joining us today for a conversation with two of my colleagues, uh, Marjorie Bussa, who is uh, the head of our Digital Society Initiative, uh, Executive Director, and Hans Kunani, Senior Fellow in our Europe Programme, but the reason we thought it'd be especially good to have Hans with us is he is leading our Commission on Democracy and Technology, uh, in particular thinking about mm -hmm. the modernization of democracy in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to later in our conversation with Audrey, mm -hmm. looking at parallels mm -hmm. and lessons mm -hmm. uh, that maybe we can learn in Europe from the experience of Taiwan, or certainly mm -hmm. to compare uh, mm -hmm. experiences uh, between mm -hmm. the two. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Audrey, I'm just going to, I mean, I think your name is now well known. It was pretty well known prior to COVID-19, but with mm -hmm. Taiwan having really come into the public mm -hmm. presence um, because of its very successful response to mm -hmm. the COVID-19 outbreak, mm -hmm. people have been trying to work out how did that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and the use of digital technology, the fact that Taiwanese citizens appear to be so comfortable Mm -hmm. with the kind of digital-led responses, whereas we in Europe, uh, you know, uh, uh, are trying to hold digital innovation back in many cases because we're so suspicious of it. Clearly, um, there was an advantage to the fact that you became mm -hmm. digital minister mm -hmm. for Taiwan back in mm -hmm. October of 2016. This wasn't some mm -hmm. recent innovation. This has got four years uh, pretty mm -hmm. much history to it. That's right. And That's right. I know mm -hmm. you're somebody who... Uh, cut your teeth, not at all in politics. You mm -hmm. were somebody who uh, a software mm -hmm. program from age 12, 14, mm -hmm. somewhere around there, if I'm describing it right, mm -hmm. in, yeah, all, well, in all sorts of startups. Yes, well, internet governance is also politics, but it's not uh, representative politics, that's right. Yeah. Well, that's a very important point. And actually, uh, Hans is somebody who always reminds me that um, when you talk about democracy, uh, accountable and representative democracies are not always the same things. You've mm -hmm. got to be able to, 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 to break them apart. So can you just tell me that before we talk about COVID and so on and, and oh. your response, mm -hmm. why did Taiwan create a digital minister? Mm -hmm. What was the point? What was the driver? What did mm -hmm. you bring to the cabinet mm -hmm. as a sort of technocratic uh, invitee mm -hmm. into it? Mm -hmm. What did you bring? What mm -hmm. did the government want? Yeah, so um, a few things, right? You, you said democracy and technology as if they were two things. But in Taiwan, democracy is just a set of technologies. Uh, we literally have the first uh, presidential election back in 1996 uh, when the World Web is already in place. So it's very natural for us to see that democracy is an evolving technology, social technology, of course, uh, and applied political science uh, at that. And we see it as improving as more people participate so as digital minister, uh, I think that digital technology remain one of the best ways to improve participation, which is at the core of democracy, as long as the focus is on finding common ground and creating what I call a pro-social media, not the anti-social media, uh, and creating a rough consensus and running code, in this sense, a code running code of law. Uh, and so I bring with myself my um, experiences in multi-stakeholderism, in internet governance, in open source and free software community uh, to reimagine how democracy could be done uh, aside from traditional way of like uploading five bits per person every four years, which is called voting, uh, maybe we can increase the bit rate of democracy. 
That's, I tell you, fascinating because you, you've laid out there uh, all sorts of ideas I really look forward to unpacking. I read, uh, I, not my, my own thing, somebody quoted me the other day that uh, Alex de Tocqueville talked about democracy being a set of participations and associations. So it's exactly. amazing that you're mm -hmm. channeling today in the 20th century what he was channeling back in the 18th. I hope I got that right because that's recorded. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Hans is nodding, so I was correct on that one. Um, but uh, can I just pick you up on one point? Because you used a very important word there, mm -hmm. consensus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here we are in Europe. I mean, I'm sitting in London um, and we look over at the United States. We look at Europe. People increasingly associate democracy with a lack of consensus. Mm -hmm. Democracy about being competition between mm -hmm. different viewpoints, fighting mm -hmm. it out, winning an election, one side gets to try to implement its program for four years, and then somebody else gets a turn for three or five years mm -hmm. or whatever. But mm -hmm. you seem to be talking about democracy as a much more fluid mm -hmm. evolutionary process. And yes. you said about building consensus. Could you just mm -hmm. explain that for but a second? There was an adjective before that, though. I said uh, building rough consensus. And rough consensus is not the same as uh, like a fine consensus that you can sign your name on, that you're perfectly happy with it. Because we know on the internet, nobody has the time to do that. So people with the most time end up getting uh, their voice if you are seeking fine consensus. But rough consensus, as defined by the Internet Engineering Task Force, is just somebody we can all live with. It's a, it's a much softer sense of consensus. And in fact, in Mandarin, we say gong shi, which literally translate as common understanding. So it's just a common understanding that we can all more or less live with. And that's the kind of consensus we're seeking. So common understanding will rely critically, I'd imagine, on transparency, mm -hmm. access to information mm -hmm. that is shared by uh, the entire citizenry. Could you just say a little bit about how connected Taiwanese citizens are, their mm -hmm. capacity to engage with the type of uh, democratic uh, mm -hmm. rough consensus building you just mm -hmm. described. You know, mm -hmm. is that one of the prerequisites for mm -hmm. a successful digital democracy, that access, that mm -hmm. That, in, that sense of ownership of information, uh, but access Definitely, to definitely. In Taiwan, we have broadband as a human right. So no matter where you are in Taiwan, even at the peak of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters, uh, the Savia, the Yushan Mountain, uh, you're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second, uh, enough for high bandwidth video conferencing for just 15 euros per month, unlimited 4G or cable or fiber, one way or another. But if you don't have that access, it's my fault personally. You can just call me on it. Uh, and I'll just make sure that when we deploy 5G later this year, your place will be with the first uh, spot <laughs> that we set up 5G telecommunication towers because we explicitly said that the uh, additional uh, auction money that we got from the 5G spectrum will preferentially go to the place where there's less 4G connections. And so the broadband is human right under underpins the idea of the digital democracy because with that we're not excluding anyone. Anyone who uh, need a tablet, for example, can uh, rent it uh, for free, actually lend it uh, from a local digital opportunity center that's a public library or indigenous health care center. In, in any sense, uh, we see that people uh, trust that their voices, their ideas can be re presented uh, if they start live streaming at no additional marginal cost or things like that, uh, making Taiwan a kind of a very large town with its town hall that is always live streamed. Uh, and during the coronavirus, we do that every day. Yeah, that's the fast uh, response system that relies essentially on not excluding anyone when it comes to broadband access, and it must be symmetrical. But, you know, just one more question, because I actually I want to get a little bit into the COVID uh, response sure. side here. Mm -hmm. But one question on generations, because you talked uh, the big debate in Europe right now is generational divides mm -hmm. um, and whether these will become uh, corrosive of mm -hmm. democracy. Mm -hmm. And so when you have such a connected um, mm -hmm. uh, society, everyone has access, everyone has the right broadband as a human right. Mm -hmm. But you find that there's... Uh, a generational disengagement. Mm -hmm. Do older people engage less well? Mm -hmm. Younger mm -hmm. people engage better? Mm -hmm. um, you know, old democracy have argued in many cases the older generations are overrepresented in, mm -hmm. in traditional forms of democratic voting. You seem to be creating a world in which maybe the younger generation will feel that it has a bigger voice. How mm -hmm. do you deal with generational uh, uh, attitudes to connectivity with technology? 
according to uh, the uh, TW Nick uh, report, uh, people who are um, like between 12 and 55 uh, have roughly the same uh, internet penetration rate, which is around like 97% or something, uh, a large number, uh, 97 to 99%. Uh, and uh, for people below 12, um, I think it's at 80 something percent, 89 percent. And for people uh, between 55 and 85, I think that's also around 80 percent. So, so you see a curve, but the curve is manageable, I would say. It, it, it trails off, I think, around people who are around 75 years old. And that may not be because of generation, but maybe because of health issues. Before I bring my colleagues in on questions, I think uh, you know, what has been fascinating for so many of us around the world is the way that you've been able to take this digital connectivity, the level of trust uh, you appear to have built up around the government system to help manage your COVID response. Because mm -hmm. this is where I think when I look at the UK, um, mm -hmm. and I can speak for that as I'm based here, um, mm -hmm. it's been very difficult at a time of a lack of trust in government mm -hmm. to really pivot mm -hmm. quickly to deal with such a fast-moving mm -hmm. crisis. But mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the... Mm -hmm. um, the mm -hmm. Taiwanese response. Yeah, but when in Taiwan, when we say trust, we always mean the government trusting its citizens. Uh, and when we say transparency, we always mean making the state transparent to the people. Uh, and I have to say this up front, I, we don't mean it the other way, okay? That's some other uh, nearby jurisdiction. In any case, what I'm trying to get at uh, is that the uh, success of Taiwan, we're now officially post-pandemic for quite a while now, actually for two months now, uh, with no local confirmed cases. Uh, and I think the success is due to the social mobilization and the power of digital democracy. Uh, and that has three tenets, uh, which I call fast, fair, and fun. Um, fast uh, is the collective intelligence, whereas many jurisdictions began countering coronavirus only this year. Taiwan started last year, last December, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, posted that there are seven new SARS cases in Wuhan. Uh, he got inquiries, eventually punishment from his local police institution. But at the same time, the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit, the PTT board, has this post reposting Dr. Li Wenliang's whistleblowing. And our medical officer immediately noticed this post and issued an order that says all passengers flying in from Wuhan to Taiwan one, need to start health inspection the very next day, the first day of 2020. So this says two things. First, the civil society with this upvoting mechanism uh, trusts the government enough to talk about possible new SARS outbreak in such a public forum. And the government, of course, trusts the citizen enough to take it seriously and treat it as if SARS happened again, something we've always been preparing since 2003. According to the Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the most open society in the whole of Asia, actually the only jurisdiction in Asia that enjoy the completely free uh, freedom of speech, uh, assembly, the press, and so on as other liberal democratic countries as well, but with the emphasis on keeping an open mind to novel ideas from the society. And that is why we managed to counter the coronavirus with no lockdowns and counter the uh, infodemic with no takedown. I'll get you that later. Um, so, so for example, as I mentioned, every day our Central Epidemic Command Center, the CECC, holds a press conference at 2 p.m., which is always live streamed. And we work with the journalists. They answer all the questions from journalists either on site or online, which is always uh, also live streamed. And because of this, whenever there's a new idea coming in from the civil society, anyone can pick their phone and landline even and call this simple number 1922 and tell that idea to the CECC. For example, there was one day in April where a young boy who said he doesn't want to go to school because uh, we ration mask and when you ration, you don't get to pick the color and it just so happened that he only has pink medical me medical mask and so he doesn't want to go to school because his schoolmates may laugh at him. The very next day, everybody in the CECC start wearing pink medical mask regardless of their gender, making sure that everybody learns about gender mainstreaming, which is also a social innovation. So this kind of rapid response within 24 hour cycle builds trust between this government and the civil society. Society. The second thing is fairness. Um, you see this website called join.gov.tw, which is our national participation platform with a lot of good ideas. But in Taiwan, there's a shadow government organization called the GovZero movement or G0V that I'm also a part of that look at all the websites that they don't like and build a shadow version of it just by changing an O to a zero. Uh, so if you go to join.g0v.tw, you get connected with a bunch of civic technologists. And so when we ramped up the facial mask production, making sure everybody can use their national health insurance card to collect masks from nearby pharmacies. Everybody wants to ensure the fairness. But um, people from the GovZero community started uh, prototyping services 
that let people voluntarily report where there are their nearby shops and how many uh, medical masks do they have in stock. Uh, and uh, the National Health Insurance uh, Agency immediately notified this. Uh, and uh, the premier asked me, what, what's this about? I'm like, this is like a, a, you know, a navigation system. And he's like, oh, it's just like a GPS. Uh, and so he said that we need to support the social sector. So what we did is that we trusted them with open data and we published every 30 seconds all the different pharmacies, not just locations, but the real time is like a distributed ledger, uh, how many adult masks and children's masks are still in stock. That's why GovZero and many community collaborators built more than 100 tools that enable people, for example, people with blindness uh, who prefer to hear from voice assistants or chatbots and so on, all of them can get the same inclusive access to the information about which pharmacy near them still have masks. And because the national health insurance covers more than 99.99% of citizens and also residents, people who show any symptom will then be able to take medical masks from a nearby pharmacy, go to a local clinic, knowing that they will get treated fairly without incurring any financial burden, COVID or not. And this also, enable civic technologists to make dashboard that let people see that our supply is indeed growing. This is when we ramped up the production from 2 million a day to 20 million a day. And so that you can now collect if you're an adult, nine facial masks every two weeks or 10 if you are a child. And this also is evidence-based policymaking because this uh, social sector built dashboard showed us where in Taiwan do we have over or under supply and we change uh, our supply strategy with the pharmacies, co-creating with the real feedback of the pharmacies and with the whole of society. And based on this analysis, as you can see, our premier here, Su Chen Chang, is smiling happily because uh, according to analysis, our medical mask after one uh, month of the rationing through pharmacies peak at 70% of population. The other 30% are people who work very long hours so that after they uh, go off work, um, the pharmacies are all closed. So we started working with convenience store that you can now also take the same NHI card to go there and collect your mask anytime, 24 hours a day. Of course, now in addition to ration, there's also a free market. But the point here is that when uh, we were quite short on the medical mask, everybody gets treated very uh, fairly. And there's uh, more than 21 million out of 23 million people who have access to this digital service using the NHI card. And so we ensure fairness of all kinds across all the different regions. And finally, I would like to stress because this a very stressful time. People feel anxious. Uh, there's a associated infodemic, uh, panic buying, conspiracy theories, things like that. And in Taiwan, our disinformation strategy is based on the idea of humor over rumor. Whenever there is a panic buying of tissue paper, for example, there was a rumor that says, oh, tissue paper are made out of the same material as facial masks because we're ramping up production. Uh, people uh, will uh, go out and buy because they think that tissue paper will run out soon. And the same premier, which you just saw smile in the previous slide, now shows this bottom, uh, wiggling it a little bit, uh, and says in very large print that we only have one pair of Botox each, uh, meaning that we don't need to panic buy tissue papers because stockpile and Botox sound the same as a hom homonym uh, in Mandarin. And then, of course, the real payload of this meme is a clear table that says facial masks are produced using domestic material and tissue paper produced using South American material. And this went absolutely viral. This maybe has an R0 value of three. Uh, and because of that, the panic buying of tissue paper died down within a day or two. And we eventually discovered the people who spread the rumor in the first place was a tissue paper reseller. And this is not just a single shot uh, social media campaign. Every single CECC daily press conference gets translated by the Ministry of Health and Welfare spokes dog, or Dong Zhong Dong Chai, the, the doji, uh, dog CEO. Um, that's translates, for example, physical distancing. When you're outdoor, you need to stay two dogs apart, indoor, three dogs apart, uh, hand sanitation rules, um, not touching your uh, face with your hand uh, and wear a mask to re remind yourself of that, uh, pay for your pre-orders on mask rationing and so on, all into very cute dog memes that all have a R value of over one. And because uh, all of this goes viral, we make sure that our humor, factual humor, spreads faster than rumor and it gets remixed by all the different social sector comedians. And that is how we make sure that Taiwanese people still feel calm and collected even during the pandemic. And so that's my five minute slide. Uh, you can read more at Taiwan can help that us. Thank you very much for that incredibly rapid run through um, the COVID approach. And I think you've you've confirmed about this combination of government really using rapid, fast online means, almost keeping ahead of the public mood, uh, preventing, as you said, rumors from becoming facts. You always feel in many democracies, governments are 
desperately racing to catch up. But I hear you saying there in a way is you're you're sort of keeping yourself um, ahead. But I, mm -hmm. I, w I was surprised you didn't address one issue, which is really at the absolute heart of the debate in Europe and in the US about this post COVID, if we can use that term period, mm -hmm. which is the role of technology in tracking and tracing. Mm -hmm. because, yeah, because you know, we, we have where, yeah. no apps that uh, sense Bluetooth or whatever signals. We deploy no such apps. So you have no, you're, you're just not taking that route at all. So you will, will not be using technology mm -hmm. the way that every European country is saying right now, the only way we can get out of lockdown confidently is to be able to track and trace people. And this is where they're putting all of their technology effort along with vaccines. So well, can you just explain well, why is Taiwan uh, not uh, doing the most digitally uh, advanced, uh, advanced democracy uh, is not using digital for the thing everyone else wants to use it for? We, we are explain? using digital. We are not using apps. So right. uh, apps like Musk become useful only if you can get the majority of people deploying it. And you need right. an incentive design for that. For Musk, we say this protects you from your own hands. It's a yes. kind of selfish incentive. Uh, yeah. For apps, much harder to do that, actually. Uh, and so instead, uh, what we did is border quarantine. Uh, when you uh, arrive at our airports or seaport, uh, you're asked to make a choice. You can either go to a quarantine hotel uh, where you are physically barred from leaving uh, for 14 days, or if you live with no vulnerable group of people, you can choose to stay home, but then your phone, which uh, already have its signal strength checked by the nearby telecom towers anyway, uh, will be put into what we call a digital fence. And it's uh, reusing ex existing collected data. It's not some new data we're collecting. Uh, using triangulation uh, in urban areas, we know that this phone is within like a 50 meter radius. And if they exceed that radius or if it runs out of battery, uh, the telecom send an automated SMS just as our earthquake warnings and hurricane warnings uh, to a local uh, household manager or local police officer, which will then check uh, your whereabouts. Uh, and that is the constitutional limit of 14 days after which uh, we have no constitutional basis uh, to track you because we never declare a uh, emergency situation, uh, a state of emergency. So we have to make do uh, with whatever the parliament have authorized us to do anyway. And so we reused a lot of collected data uh, by but in a way that's uh, out of its original collective purpose, but also still firmly within the constitutional limit. So in a nutshell, you are tracking and tracing, but you're just doing it using the existing technologies and relying in a way on, on citizens, obviously, to obey the law. If they don't, there is a system to be able to track it, but you're not having to create a whole superstructure of new digital uh, um, uh, infrastructure to be able yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, people yeah. get SMS warnings from like imminent earthquakes or flood warnings all yeah. the time. So it's easy to explain that it's the same technology. Yeah. Whereas interestingly enough, we don't get messages, SMS messages from our government. Oh, wow. So if we did, we'd probably, <laughs> we'd probably scream in horror, you know, because we think somehow we're being watched when of course we are, but we don't know it. Um, I think it's a good point to let me, if I can bring my colleague Marjorie in, uh, who I introduced earlier. Uh, Executive Director of our Digital Society Initiative. Margie, why don't you come in? There's so many interesting things. I'll let you pick your question. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And Audrey, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have you. It's so stimulating and also refreshing because you perspective on technology is quite different from the main narrative that we have today. And I think the example of the way you use contact tracing, mm -hmm. um, there's a clear sunset close. It's evident when it's going to stop and it's mm -hmm. after there's quarantine. Mm -hmm. When in Europe, there's no clear start, also no clear end. Um, and that's also a very interesting difference there. But um, I want to talk a little bit about this perception and attitudes toward technology, because as I say, it's really refreshing. In, in Europe, we are really grown suspicious of digital technologies. Since 2017, you can see that there's more appetite for technology regulation, there's more fear, and we talk more about the perils or the you know, risk related to digital technology, and that's manipulation of information, as you alluded to, but also, um, you know, for digital platform, mental health issues or addiction. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's a mm -hmm. strong effort here to regulate and also to moderate and curate what people and citizens say online, because we've seen a lot of abuse. So um, I'd be very interested to hear about, first, Taiwanese attitude towards technology and your appetite or your perspective on how much 
digital technology and platforms should be regulated. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, moderation, uh, I guess, is good in theory. Uh, and theory is good in moderation. Uh, but I think the point about moderation is that it needs to be accountable uh, in a participatory way. You just saw the mask map. And if you go to a pharmacy, swipe your NHI card, check after a minute or two, and see really that the stock level decreased by nine or 10 if you're a child, you, you trust the system more, right? Because that's essentially um, participatory uh, accountability. But if the government insists on publishing the, the sum uh, every week uh, or like in many freedom of information access every month, right? Uh, then people have no way of participating in holding each other and the pharmacist uh, accountable. And so a distributed ledger that is essentially an open API that doesn't pass uh, before uh, the eyes of any human beings before it gets published, uh, publishing upon collection, I think is a very powerful idea because of that, uh, everybody can form data collaboratives uh, that look at those numbers as I showed the dashboard uh, built by the academic sector uh, or uh, the uh, over and under supply by the economic sector and so on and because everybody shared the, the same ground truth so to speak uh, and everybody can call 1922 if they see uh, that uh, they bought nine masks but actually the stock uh, increased by nine um, so everybody trusts these numbers more and and this I think is something that is really missing uh, from a lot of cross-sectoral collaboration is simply that the ground truth of the shared data or the shared ledger is not there. And when it's not there, of course, people will second guess each other. And in Taiwan, I think it's not just about the COVID. For example, around air pollution, uh, we rely on the environmental uh, total sensing network uh, called the Airbox. That is just less than 100 euro each. It's deployed in many primary schools, in balconies, and so on. And altogether, they ride into this distributed ledger that nobody can go back in time to change. Uh, and then the social sector with more than 10,000, I think now, environmental sensors are uh, all puzzled together, the PM 2.5 level and other levels uh, in the atmosphere. And then they have sufficient clout then to convince the public sector uh, to work uh, with them uh, and to install in the economic sector, like in the industrial parks uh, on the lamps because, of course, the high school teachers cannot break into the industrial park to install uh, air, air box sensors, uh, but we own the lamp, so we can do that. So it is the social sector gaining legitimacy, working with the public sector to set fair rules and norms, and with those norms to convince the economic sector to scale it up and scale it out. And that's precisely the kind of the uh, uh, people, public, private partnership that I described on the mask rationing, which is quite a different order, actually, from the traditional PPPP. But it sounds to me, therefore, Audrey, that the role of civil society is incredibly important mm -hmm. within the Taiwanese democratic yeah, system. Yeah, so, so important that like I call it the social sector. Yeah, yeah so yeah, important that I call it the social sector. Yeah, yeah, the social sector rather mm -hmm. than civil society. And mm -hmm. but, but what are these are these could be, uh, are they just sort of traditional NGOs? Are they large mm -hmm. uh, organizations? Are they mm -hmm. very local? Do they mm -hmm. emerge and disappear? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. because civil society mm -hmm. in the UK mm -hmm. or in Europe, we think of these large, mm -hmm. often well-known, mm -hmm. quite well-funded organizations mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. specialize in particular mm -hmm. sectors of yeah, we have that housing too. or environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have that too. Explain Taiwan. Mm -hmm. OK, yes. We have that too. Uh, uh, even before the lifting of the martial law at the 80s, uh, there are many uh, charities specializing in placemaking, in humanitarian aid, uh, in co-op movement uh, on both the consumption part and the agricultural part and so on. And I'm sure that broadly speaking, it's the same as the, the UK's understanding uh, of the co-ops and uh, NGOs. Uh, however, in Taiwan, there's also um, a different configuration, which I would uh, say uh, it's more like a uh, Autocracy, in the sense that uh, they're loosely based on internet communities. They still meet uh, because in Taiwan, from the southmost to the northmost municipality is just 95 minutes away by high speed rails. Uh, so people meet together quite often. Uh, and like the GovZero community is one prime example. Uh, at the moment, on the uh, GovZero community, um, and which everybody can join, I just shared the URL join.g0v.tw uh, uh, on the uh, chat room. Uh, we can very easily see that there are more than 7,700 uh, people uh, on the chat room, the general chat room, and of which more than 565 
are now working on COVID-19. That's the COVID-19 chat room. And, and that's actually more than membership of many traditional NGOs. Uh, and so these kind of um, internet-based uh, communities uh, and projects, I think, uh, complement the uh, old uh, more placemaking or human right or other uh, otherwise, um, you know, uh, respected uh, NGOs. And these two groups of people, instead of kind of working against each other, they work very closely with one another, especially during the Occupy Parliament uh, in 2014, uh, March. Uh, at that time, the 20 NGOs, all quite uh, well known and have a high legitimacy, deliberated on one aspect each of the cross trade and service trade agreement, the CSSTA. For example, one particular NGO talks about whether we need to uh, allow PRC components, People's Republic of China jurisdiction components, into our then new 4G network. So we had that discussion like five years before anyone else. Uh, and that's just one of the 20 discussions uh, around the occupied parliament, which was occupied because the MPs were refusing to deliberate substantially that agreement with Beijing. And because of that, the digital uh, communities ensure the fair communication right. Uh, we live stream all the NGOs meetings. We do transcriptions. We make sure that we consolidate a facilitated consensus every day, inching toward rough consensus until three weeks after where we reach 40 months, not one less, uh, and the head of parliament actually accepted that. So based on that experience, the traditional MPOs and the newer generation of internet enabled hacktivists, for the lack of a better word, uh, become very close allies. Very interesting. Um, before I turn to hands, one very practical question. What did you what did you decide about allowing PRC companies into your 4G? Did you decide yes or no? Uh, we decided that uh, there is no market player when it comes to 4G infrastructure. So we said no, because uh, it's always state owned uh, or eventually state owned. Um, and it's not uh, an application of uh, what we call fair market rules, because um, the fact that the CCP installed bar party branches in all these large companies tells us that they are, in fact, de facto party owned and therefore state owned. So we said no. There we go. Clear answer for that. And uh, as you know, a big debate in the UK about that right now. I know. Hans, <laughs> let, me, let me invite Hans in because I'm sure he's got uh, bubbling with questions from all you've said. Hans, wh where do you want to go on this? Yeah, lots of things I could ask about. Really, really interesting, Audrey. Um, I, I guess I'd like to ask a bit more about Taiwan's specific democratic culture. Because, um, I mean, as Robin was indicating at the beginning, you know, we've all been looking at Taiwan, also at some other East Asian democracies like South Korea since the coronavirus began um, and, and trying to think about what we can learn from you. Um, and in particular, to what extent your approach to the coronavirus is sort of transferable to Europe. Um, and, you know, it struck me, I mean, Robin already mentioned this, you know, some of the things that I mean, each of these countries, South Korea, Taiwan, have taken a slightly different approach. But it seems to me that there are elements of each of them that Europeans would struggle with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, as Robin was suggesting, this idea that you would get a message um, from um, the government mm -hmm. telling you that you have, you know, moved uh, you know, too far away from the place you're supposed to be quarantined in, I think Europeans would find quite disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there are some variations within Europe. You know, Germans, for example, are particularly kind of sensitive about these things. Brits, perhaps less so. But overall, I think that would that would be seen as being problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and then similarly, you know, I was struck when you were presenting your slides talking about the government information campaigns, mm -hmm. you know, and how instantly, you know, the government information campaign changed people's minds about something. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. The government here trying mm -hmm. to do that, I mean, and that's before we talk about America, mm -hmm. I just think people wouldn't have that much um, faith or, or trust in mm -hmm. what the government said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I guess that all brings me to, I mean, as I say, I, I just like to sort of hear a little bit more about Taiwan's specific democratic culture, what you think makes it different from the democratic culture in other places. Mm -hmm. One thing I do wonder about is it, it's very striking to me that both Taiwan and South Korea are very new democracies. That's right. 
right? That's right. You Democracy for us is just a set of it. technology. Yes. I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about it in the way that you put it, that the first presidential election you had in 1996 mm -hmm. was after the creation of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Taiwanese democracy more broadly only goes back to the 80s and, and South Korea is also a new democracy. So I suppose there are different ways of thinking about how that newness of your democracy affects these things. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on you know, is there something specific about East Asian democracies? Is there something specific about new democracies mm -hmm. that means that you deal with all these questions around mm -hmm. technology and how that impacts mm -hmm. rights and freedom, mm -hmm. liberal mm -hmm. democratic rights and freedoms in a different mm -hmm. way than mm -hmm. we in Europe do? Well, I, I mean, there are also European uh, counterparts of our work, right? Uh, Estonia was founded after the internet. Uh, and um, Iceland also, uh, their constitutional and the better Reykjavik platform, uh, also after the wild web, actually, actually after the social media. Uh, and so I, I don't think this is an East Asian thing, right? If you have a generation of people who don't think democracy as something of a proud legacy tradition thing, but rather as a set of living technologies that they can all participate in, increase the bit rate, um, then they will see, you know, the tech companies like Facebook, Google, Google, Amazon, whatever, and, and so on, uh, as you know, not monopolizing the word tech. Uh, democracy is tech. Uh, so the web is no more of a tool of capitalism than paper was, right? Paper is paper. Um, uh, writing is writing. Uh, and so the idea uh, is that not that the, the state must be weak for the market to be strong or the state must be strong for the market to obey or anything like that, but rather um, the, the government need to radically trust its people by making how we work transparent so that people are on the same page as us. And when we do that, then people feel free to, to remix however they want uh, on those cute dog messages. Uh, and so the, the, basically the idea is that democracy itself is a platform. Liberal democracy um, can enable all sort of uh, local and online and whatever decision makings, including sandboxes, presidential hackathons, participatory budgeting, all sort of different experiments being tried out in Taiwan in a presidential hackathon. Every year we hand out five teams, uh, no money, but a shape of Taiwan with a micro projector. If you turn it on, it projects the president handing you the trophy. So it's self-describing and promising that whatever you've made in the past three months will become national policy in the next 12 months. So that's executive buying power as a hackathon prize. Uh, and so when you do mechanism design for participation in the participatory way, there really is no limit uh, to what the innovative people in the uh, civil society can suggest. And you just put the agenda setting power to the people. And that is the extent of uh, democracy as a platform. So that's why I think people think tech as not something that only the private sector captures. The civil sector, if they want, they can just start measuring air quality, water quality, whatever, uh, anytime, and actually really co-create with the government. Because I'm wondering whether that, in a way, Hans was asking uh, also about the culture. You know, the, mm -hmm. the danger is, have we spent too long developing an adversarial confrontational culture around mm -hmm. our democracy in many European countries. You noted Estonia, Iceland, but these are, I would say, exceptions rather than proving a rule. Mm -hmm. Amanda, you wanted to come in on this point maybe yeah, as well. Actually, a very short comment, but I think it's fascinating also because the debate we have here and we have often highlighted the deep cultural differences between the political community, policy community and technologists. And that essentially they don't understand each other, they don't have the same values, they don't understand the systems. And then a lot of what we do is trying to put them together with some clashes, but essentially deeply rooted different perception of what democracy, what processes, what values are. And which to some extent doesn't seem to be the case or never had mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. to start with in, in mm -hmm. Taiwan. Yeah, but, but it's, a, it's a new culture in Taiwan, too. I mean, uh, prior to the Sunflower Occupy, if you ask a random person on the street that uh, whether they think that just 5,000 people on an e-petition uh, platform can just uh, basically bind any minister on a face-to-face -face meeting twice a month, uh, or that we will have a assistive intelligence AI-powered conversation uh, method to find a solution to the UberX uh, problem back then, people would look at you funny and say, that's not possible. We all know that the state is bureaucratic. I really think that after the Occupy in 2014, uh, the norm changed in politics because the demonstration was not a protest. It was a 
demo as a real demonstration of how half a million people on the street and many more online can come to four consensus items and bind the parliament to it. They demanded, in a way, you, you, you had an, we had an Occupy movement, obviously, in, in many Western countries around the austerity and the, and the financial crash. But it sounds like you had almost a national, I describe it, like a national trauma or a national awakening, um, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. you could say Estonia did as well, partly because of its uh, ability That's to right. escape exactly. from yes. Soviet control. Yes. Uh, I, I, there's a few other countries that have had quite the same awakening, although the you know, election of Emmanuel like, Macron in France mm-hmm. was an awakening yeah. of a sort. Yes. Uh, I mean, it didn't create a new digital democracy, but it destroyed several uh, established parties in yeah, the process. Spain, Spain was like that during the 15M also. Yeah, so yeah. maybe, I mean, but this is very interesting on the, on the culture mm-hmm. point and what drives that change and when the appetite comes. Can I ask you, I mean, two questions connected to this, one small, one big. The smaller mm-hmm. one, well, it's small. Um, the press, mm-hmm. the role of media. Mm-hmm. You know, again, we in the West think of our democracies as, as in a way, guarded in many cases, mm-hmm. not just by having an opposition, mm-hmm. but also mm-hmm. having a media that's sort of independent. Uh, we can debate how independent the media is, uh, mm-hmm. but it's not government control, let's put it that way, uh, mm-hmm. in many democracies. And uh, they're seen as the guardian against mm-hmm. government mm-hmm. excess, government corruption. They're meant to be the providers of transparency. What role does the media play in Taiwan? And what, what do you think about the role of the media? Yeah, well, both my parents are journalists. The, the point is that uh, news work and journalism in Mandarin is, is the same word. Uh, so journalism is literally news work. Uh, and so we say disinformation. And, and when we counter disinformation, Journalists are our best friends, our best ally. Uh, we share the same liberal democratic tradition that sees journalism as keeping us accountable and honest. Uh, it's they who report, for example, for the digital fence. Uh, I think the approval rate of the CECC measures was around 94% at that time. Uh, and uh, they report how the other 6% people think. And that's very important because that keeps us honest and accountable of all our work. Uh, and then it became... Uh, 96 percent but in any case um <laughs> right i mean so uh the, the point here uh, what i'm trying to make is that the journalist uh, is really um the, the the uh most important part not only on the fact checking but also on teaching the whole society of how to talk about uh things in an evidence-based fact-based uh basis and they're they're basically gu- uh, guardians of ground truth and that's why we put in our basic curriculum uh starting from seven years old from the first grade that everybody uh, in the school learn about media competence and note that we say competence and not literacy because literacy would be about how you consume media, but competence is about how you make media, recognizing that many primary schoolers maybe have an Instagram account with more followers than me. Uh, and so they are all media in a sense. And so it's uh, of utmost importance that they learn about how a journalist looks at the news sources, how to balance the narratives, how uh, does the framing effect work and things like that, because they too are amateur journalists to a degree, and they do participate actually, for example, fact-checking or our three presidential candidates during the platform debates and so on. Very interesting. Uh, Hans, did you want to come in on this or not? I, no. No, no, go, uh, ahead. Hans, go ahead. Well, just, just, uh, but it, it just strikes me that on media, it's almost like that Taiwan uh, has an openness, maybe I'm over-interpreting it here, to want to come uh, and be united in this project that you've described. To mm-hmm. what extent is there something unique about Taiwan Mm-hmm. that is imposed by the discipline of having the PRC next door. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you, you talked here about, you know, dealing and countering disinformation. The, 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 the key mm-hmm. value of a free press is that they mm-hmm. counter the disinformation. Is there something unique about Taiwan, its willingness to mm-hmm. cohere, to come mm-hmm. together around this mm-hmm. heavy use of digital technology that is yeah. partly inspired mm-hmm. by Mm-hmm. driven by mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. proximity to China and mm-hmm. the, the kind of threat that it's seen as mm-hmm. presenting to, to Taiwan's very uh, existential survivability. Well, there's, there's some of that, uh, but I think a large part of that is our own past, right? Uh, for people who are above 35, that includes me, uh, we remember how the martial law was, uh, which by and large was not that different from what PRC is now doing to their journalists. Uh, and so uh, what I'm trying to say is that for people of a, above a certain age, 
not going back to the martial law days uh, is of core importance that we need to counter disinformation without resorting to censorship and takedowns because have we done that uh, all the democratic struggle that we made uh, to live us out of the martial law will be in vain uh, and I think that is really at the core. And of course, PRC keeps reminding our new generation how it was in the martial law days in Taiwan. Very interesting. Lay your hands, I'll let you come in now. Very yeah, I mean, this, this whole issue, which you've just come back to now, of sort of Taiwan's history and the democratic transition and how recent that is, is so interesting. I mean, earlier on, you were sort of suggesting that it was there's always been an advantage in a way for, for Taiwan. And then you pointed to these European counterparts like Estonia. I think in the European debate, though, what's quite interesting is you also have these countries like Hungary, particularly, and Poland, you know, which also made a democratic transition relatively recently, you know, in the 90s. And I think part of the conclusion that many, you know, Europeans are now coming to is that actually it takes a really long time to sort of embed a real democratic culture and that you can go backwards, right? Um, you know, as Hungary kind of seems to illustrate. Um, and so what I think is so interesting is, um, you know, this question of how Taiwan apparently so quickly has developed a really deep democratic culture. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, again, to, to come back to some of the issues around the, the coronavirus and the, the coronavirus response, um, I think what a lot of us worry about is that is the way that, I mean, if you think of liberal democracy as being on the one hand, you know, participation, as you mm -hmm. said, voting and so on. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the liberal part of it, in other words, mm -hmm. a set of, you know, guaranteed rights mm -hmm. and freedom mm -hmm. you know, guaranteed by a constitution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the thing that many of us worry about is that in the context of coronavirus, it sort of almost mm -hmm. pushes you to mm -hmm. restrict some of those freedoms and rights. Mm -hmm. Now, on the one hand, there's the, the way we've all been forced to do a lockdown of some kind. I mean, you said you haven't, which is- Yeah, I, we, we, we have no lockdowns. And right. so lockdown but, is on an even more fundamental right, which is right of freedom. Right. Uh, to move, so that's, right? That's, that's one side of it is sort of rights and freedoms in the real world, as it were. But then on the other hand, you do have um, this whole question around mm. privacy rights in relation mm. to the use of data. And so mm. that's where I think it is quite interesting mm. that you know, mm -hmm. some of the things that you said yeah. that, that Taiwan mm -hmm. has, has mm -hmm. done, yeah, I think yeah. some Europeans mm -hmm. would worry mm -hmm. that that would be a sort mm -hmm. of um, a kind of a a kind mm -hmm. of democratic rollback mm -hmm. almost, a liberal, well, liberal if, if you If you choose to go to a, a quarantine hotel, which is entirely your choice, uh, we still pay you, um, I think, 30 euros per day as stipend. Uh, but you find, find you, we find you a thousand times that if you break. Uh, but uh, in a physical quarantine hotel, it's very hard to break, though. Uh, but what I'm trying to get at is that there's always a choice. Uh, and also that the digital fence is strictly less intrusive than the quarantine hotel, actually. Uh, and uh, we use already collected data, meaning that uh, it's not GPS. We don't know which room you are in. We, we don't know which floor uh, in the building you are in, actually. Uh, so the resolution, uh, the uh, fineness of the, the detection is, strictly speaking, um, just needed uh, for people who break the quarantine to get a notification. And even then, uh, there may be some false positives or things like that. People are always very friendly um, about going it. So uh, first of all, I would say that it's not a rollback at all. Because back when SARS happened in 2003, we had to barricade an entire hospital unannounced with no fixed termination date. And that is the encroachment of the fundamental freedoms. And our constitutional court, which had a interpretation and a large debate right after SARS, said that even barricading an entire hospital was constitutional because it saved uh, lockdown in other places in Taiwan. But right. please, legislation, figure out something like the CECC that has a clear termination date, that has a pre-communicated set of rules, and most importantly, pre-authorized by the parliament. And so that's a kind of societal inoculation. And, and I think that's what the European countries are now being inoculated for a lack of better word. Just um, a follow-up question on this. Is, is this outlook uh, the preserve of the Democratic Progressive Party? Which, which he was in whose cabinet you serve, or uh, you well, know, if it came, I work with, but yes, with sorry, exactly uh -huh. with, uh, exactly. But uh, would would you know if there were a change of government? I mean, you've mm -hmm. just been DPP has just been re-elected, obviously, so it's got another mm -hmm. four years, I presume, ahead of it. Mm -hmm. But um, if there were uh, if the KMT, um, mm -hmm. that's fine. I work with share? the KMT cabinet too. 
Yeah. Yeah, but is is the um, view shared? Is this a cross-party view? It is. This move to digital is. democracy is it shared it is. by both parties? It Definitely, is. because uh, right after the Occupy, all the mayor candidates of all parties uh, who supported the Occupy won the election. Sometimes without preparing inauguration speech, uh, and everybody who were against it, uh, either because of their party affiliation or their personal taste. Um, uh, fail the mayoral election. And that sends a sweeping political signal so that even though there was still KMT uh, that was in Ma Jiao presidency, uh, they uh, openly announced, a, a, the new premier Mao Zhiguo announced that crowdsourcing, open government data and so on need to be the new national direction. So I was actually hired as a reverse mentor back then uh, because I was uh, still under 35 at that point. I, I used reverse mentor uh, to the then minister Jacqueline Tsai actually in the very same office. <laughs> and so um, after two years working with the KMT cabinet, I guess I... I guess promoted from intern into full time, uh, but still working in the same office. So I would say uh, that currently in the parliament of all the four major parties, the KMT, the DPP, then uh, new uh, new power party, which is itself born from by the Sunflower Occupy, and also the uh, Taiwan People's Party, uh, whose uh, party chair uh, is Dr. Ko Wenzhe, who openly uh, run on open government as platform uh, during the Taipei City Mayor um, election right after the Occupy, all supported the cross parliamentary and uh, open government parliament network. They just do, did a summary declaration of all the four different parties on opening up the parliament as well. And and do you do you use referenda? I mean, is it? Yes, we it do. It almost sounds like you're beyond referendum. There's a big debate going on here in in mm -hmm. Europe as to whether referenda mm -hmm. are uh, you know, majoritarian and therefore mm -hmm. negative, or are mm -hmm. they helpful? Mm -hmm. What's your attitude to Yeah, we, we do referenda. Uh, we do alternating, yes. One year of presidential election, which, as you pointed out, we just had. And then next year, a re national referenda. And next year, a mayoral election. Uh, and then next year, a national referenda. So it's an alternating, yes. So the representative and the um, deliberative or the direct uh, doesn't interfere uh, with one another. And our referenda, uh, because it's every two years, are binding. Uh, for two years. So so you try it out for two years and see whether the people like it. Can I ask about deliberative democracy, which you did just mention in passing? Um, uh, Robin, at the beginning, talked about the work we've been doing around democracy and technology in Europe, thinking, as, as Robin indicated, also about some of the ways in which technology can help mm -hmm. deepen democracy and, and revitalize democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and so we looked in particular at these two sort of alternative forms of democracy that mm -hmm. potentially at least slightly take you beyond representative democracy, mm -hmm. i.e. direct democracy and deliberative democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the reason there's so much enthusiasm around direct democracy at the moment, although as, 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 as Robin was alluding to, there's a lot of skepticism too, but part of the reason there's a lot of enthusiasm is because of the way that it's easy to see how you could use technology to sort of scale up referendum. That's right, that's right. Um, mm -hmm. but, but what you've done in Taiwan, which is really fascinating, mm -hmm. is to do a kind of online deliberative democracy, exactly. which as far as I know is pretty much the only, um, at least successful attempt at doing that um, mm -hmm. around the world. And in general, yeah. I think there's a lot of skepticism by people who think about deliberative democracy about whether you can do that online. Can you just tell mm -hmm. us a little bit more about, um, about that mm -hmm. initiative and how you manage to mm -hmm. make deliberative democracy work mm -hmm. online? Yes. So uh, first of all, we, we always uh, bring technology to people. We never ask people to come to technology. So we do so not as a replacement for face-to-face -face, uh, deliberation, but rather we call it crowdsource agenda setting meaning that it determines what topic to talk about in the face-to-face -face deliberation. So in design thinking terms, that's either discover and define stage uh, before uh, we settle on the common how might we questions. And so what you're looking at is a real uh, example, the first example actually for it to use informal policy making back in 2015 when we did a UberX conversation. Uh, and you can see um, myself uh, as an avatar there with all my friends and families, and they represent all the different feelings across uh, the board uh, and the software analyzes automatically the most divisive point and the second most divisive point and did a kind of uh, dimension reduction so that people can see literally who are the uber supporters or, or things like that and the software is called polis it's called assistive intelligence or ai powered conversation 
And so it persists like this. We first crowdsource data. So the data around transportation, about the use of the public roads and things like that from all the different sectors, and we publish those. And after reading those data, everybody for three or four weeks can just share what they feel about it. And the great thing about this is that there's no right or wrong thing about feelings. Uh, many democratic designs, deliberative or not, skip this step. But this is the crucial step. Um, people are encouraged to share, and there's no right or wrong, what they feel about this common data. And then we brainstorm about possible ideas, and the best ideas are the ones that address the most people's feelings, which then gets translated into regulation. So in user experience terms, uh, it's a very simple wiki survey, a crosser survey. Everybody going into here, uh, see one sentiment from one fellow citizen, in this case, yours truly, who said that I think passenger liability insurance should be mandatory for riders on Uber X private vehicles. And if you agree, you move slightly toward me. If you disagree, you move slightly uh, away from me. Uh, and then you see the next one uh, until you get uh, a new idea. And then you can share uh, using uh, registration is important, taxation is important, or whatever. And, and other people would then also upvote or download on um, your idea. And the great thing about this interface is not only that it provides instant ratification, but also there is no reply button. With no reply button, there is no room for troll to grow because you cannot, you literally cannot make a personal attack on this platform. And so after three weeks, we always get this shape where people agree to uh, be different on many divisive statements, which are often ideological about the nature of platform economy or whatever, and which we always table. Uh, we acknowledge, but we never talk about these. But then we look at a consensus statement, of which there are many. And people find that they agree with most of the things, with most of their neighbors, most of the time, simply because uh, the software rewards people who propose more nuanced, more eclectic uh, comments. And so this is actually a, a real screenshot from another conversation. And uh, to prove this doesn't work only in Taiwan, this is in Bowling Green, Kentucky, USA. Uh, and they had a virtual town hall using the same police technology. And regardless of people who identify as Democrat or Republican, Everybody agreed that in the existing curriculum of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, they need to add art to it so that it becomes STEAM, not STEM. Uh, and, and I mean, this is such a, you know, not pressworthy thing, I guess. So you never see it on the institutional media. But this is actually something that the people care really, really about. And so if the mayor accepts that, which costs almost nothing, uh, then they automatically uh, get more support from the entire population. Uh, that's the low hanging fruit. That's what I mean by rough consensus or by common understanding. And so uh, we resolve Uber uh, in this way. And we actually did coronavirus hackathon to seek the privacy enhancing technologies that will strengthen privacy and democracy. For example, there was one winning case using Polis uh, that says people should uh, have an app that works in airplane mode and only transmit uh, the information only to a medical officer and only as a one-time link that provides exactly the kind of information they need without divulging private information of your friends and families as a traditional contact tracing interview will do. And that's something that people can get behind. Fascinating. I've got a list of all those quick fire questions. I don't know if they'll be quick fire answers because they're, mm. they're, they're big, but I just think the things I don't want to miss having not talked about. Oh. And I'll let um, either uh, Hans or, or Marjorie kind of raise their hands when they want to come in if they want on anything. But if, otherwise, we'll just enjoy your answers. First sure. thing, uh, digital identities. Is mm. This is a big discussion here in Europe. So mm. how important is it that individuals can kind of take ownership of their own data, have a digital mm -hmm. identity that they curate. Is that critical to your system or mm -hmm. margin? It is, it is critical. Everybody who are born in Taiwan after I think three days gets the national health uh, insurance card without the NHI card, which is a IC card, and it's only used for public service, never for economic sector services, we would then be able to ration the masks. Right. So everyone has that, you know, where that digital identity it, it's used specifically for public service uh, provision. Yeah. Yes. Um, cyber security. Now, mm -hmm. here we are, you know, we've, we've created this incredible construct. Problem. You're next to a very large neighbor that that's pretty good um, mm -hmm. at deploying large amounts of state resources uh, mm -hmm. into uh, cyber involvement in other countries. Mm -hmm. How how much does Taiwan invest in its cybersecurity? Mm -hmm. How how resilient are you, mm -hmm. and is your system mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, mm -hmm. to this. You you mentioned some things about mm -hmm. how to avoid trolls and so on, mm -hmm. but I'm talking here about something much more systemic mm -hmm. um, yeah. or structural mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of the threat. How resilient mm -hmm. are you, and mm -hmm. where does this fit into your big picture? Yeah, very resilient. The fact that we're still talking here <laughs> proves the <laughs> resilience because it's battle hardened, quite literally. Uh, and so uh, on the hard cybersecurity side, we make sure that we allocate five to seven percent of all IT budget in all government projects to threat hunting, penetration testing, working with the white hat community. And we're looking to increase that to five to seven percent of all government project uh, going forward, uh, which is a huge sum. Right. So basically, we see it as, as a extension of the national uh, security. And we also want uh, our uh, cybersecurity industry to be seen as essentially battle hardened. And if you're a white hat hacker in Taiwan, you have plenty of choices to, uh, to penetration test before those public service goes public. You get to meet with the minister or the president all the time. You are, get treated as national heroes. So you don't get fall to the dark side, which always has more cookies. Uh, and that is basically <laughs> our strategy. Fantastic. Um, you know, the, the, just a question about the, the kind of future. The sh you've talked about the sharing economy. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you could just share a quick thought, because one of the points Hans has often made is we spend a lot of time uh, talking about the way technology is affecting democracy. But quite often, democracy is simply being undermined by a loss of the social contract around the political economies around which many democracies were founded. And actually, mm -hmm. technology is simply... Uh, a second order effect. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean by the sharing economy? I mean, how mm -hmm. optimistic are you about the future mm -hmm. of a more technologically mm -hmm. uh, engaged workforce, etc.? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So uh, I mean sharing economy uh, in what many people would mean uh, would use uh, words like uh, cooperatives or collaborative uh, economy, uh, meaning that people who own or at least co-own uh, their mode of production specifically jointly control the data and the use of data, uh, which is part of the GDPR. But uh, there's very few cases like Airbox in Taiwan that people truly jointly control and determine the use of their collective data. So uh, I think it was called in an international article about Taiwan's uh, COVID response as uh, participatory self-surveillance, meaning that the data is produced and collected by the citizenry for the citizenry, shared with the citizenry and not with any company or the state, and they negotiate based on these terms. And I think these kind of economic structures uh, is, is really powerful in the sense that the social sector can determine their own mode of distribution and production and even making their own uh, decision structures without actually a lot of surveillance capitalism or surveillance state uh, side effects. And uh, I'm really a proponent of that. And because of mass creationing, uh, everybody in Taiwan now have a taste of that, that they have an app that can see all the health uh, data or the medical prescription and things like that, that are individually invisible outside of the original uh, clinic or hospital, but used in the same app, they own that data and can jointly control its use. Very interesting. Um, and uh, just in the sense of, 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 of education and citizen skills, uh, I presume this is just a critically important part. So the digital element is built into, uh, you talked about STEAM, uh, that was a US example you gave there, but to, people think of Taiwan as, as a nation full of brilliant technologists, probably because mm -hmm. of your large semiconductor in, uh, industry and so on. But are mm -hmm. you facing some of the similar challenges other parts of the world are with levels of education, making sure you have a citizenry that's, that's going to be ready for this much mm -hmm. more digitally mm -hmm. driven world? Yeah, I think we're uniquely prepared because the, not only the education budget uh, is seen as uh, one of the two, uh, um, like, I, 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 I mean, in Taiwan, we would say that we're a social democracy uh, on uh, healthcare and on education. That simply living anywhere behind is intolerable uh, when it comes to education and healthcare. Uh, and so, just like we have a single payer health system that take care of everybody's needs, uh, we also have a very vibrant education system that authorizes, for example, alternative education, uh, including homeschooling. I'm a homeschooler myself, uh, and all all sorts of different uh, configuration of education that feeds back into the curriculum. And all the different K to 12 schools can try their own kind of mini curriculum. Uh, as a way of uh, working with the ever-changing world. And I think uh, we're uniquely prepared for that. I've got one last question. Uh, I think my colleagues are, are happy for me to do it. I don't think exactly. 
So, um, and it's, I suppose, slightly more political, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. just thinking that you know, there seems to be a remarkable acceleration taking place in Taiwan around the whole way you're designing your democracy, which is mm -hmm. why there's so much interest mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. other parts of the world. How much, though, is the urgency that I hear in your voice, mm -hmm. the drive mm -hmm. driven by the mm -hmm. centralization that's taking mm -hmm. place just across uh, mm -hmm. in your large neighbor? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the move to a one country, two system, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a re-exploration of what that's really going to mean in Hong Kong mm -hmm. seems to have really well, mobilized I, yeah, people I, I don't think they even say that in Hong Kong anymore, right? Yeah, well, that's what I mean. In a way, maybe you, you've you already moved into a different... Yeah, so, well, you've obviously mm -hmm. got a chart ready for them, this, so uh, this was not planned. This is very mm -hmm. interesting. Explain right. what you mean by this one. Right, so this these are sustainable development goals and specifically oh, yeah. targets in the SDG 17. Uh, and I think uh, the new hashtag, uh, Taiwan Can Help or Taiwan Is Helping, symbolizes uh, that this is not being motivated uh, only by a nearby jurisdiction or that we're competitive in any sort or things like that, but rather by a realization that the pandemic is a great amplifier. Uh, in places with authoritarian tendencies, the pandemic amplify authoritarian uh, measures, right? Yep. In places where people put more trust in um, um, the economic sector <laughs> than the state, uh, the multinational economic sector gains a boon in trust. Uh, we see that already in some places. Or in Taiwan, where people trust the social sector to come up with the solutions, uh, then we see a lot more trust and, and the deepening of democracy during the pandemic. And so I think it's, it's very important to remember uh, that IT, uh, information technology, or ICT, including communication technology, is a amplifier of the underlying value of the society. And the value, uh, to quote the SDGs, uh, are still reliable data, effective partnerships, and open innovation, something that all the different nations of different philosophies managed to agree back in 2015 about the common goals. And, and so that may be kind of seem archaic now, but I think it's still very important to uh, look back at what we all agreed in 2015 and think beyond the terms of ICT technologies, as my job description uh, said. Um, my job description, by the way, was written roughly at the same time as the SDGs gets translated into Mandarin uh, back in 2016. And they translate these three goals into just plain English to highlight the difference between a ICT-based technologist technocrat thinking uh, versus a digital inclusive uh, thinking. And I'll just quote it here because it's a very short poem. Uh, and, and it says this, when we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. <laughs> I tell you, you've uh, you've clearly done one or two interviews recently because that was a very, very neat way to end. I was trying to think how to pull together the threads of this great conversation. Um, but I particularly like your idea of the plurality being near, not least because I think um, uh, in the West, if I can put it that way, certainly here in the UK, the idea of pluralism has always been held up as that, you know, that ambition and that thing that we subscribe to and believe in. Mm -hmm. uh, and singularity, that very phrase of it is partly what frightens people about the technological future. But Audrey mm -hmm. Tang, I think what you've done for us today uh, at a time of anxiety, in many cases, pessimism, acceleration of negative trends, you've really given us an insight into the acceleration potential of positive trends, mm -hmm. especially around democracy, which is so important to all of us. And I'll just reiterate what I said at the beginning with our, it being our centenary year. Uh, we've made uh, thinking about the future and the updating and the modernization of, of democracy and accountable government in general. I think this idea of accountable governance, which I think you've really put at the heart of it, government being accountable to its citizens, not the other way around. That's one of the values I think I speak on behalf of my colleagues we certainly subscribe to. And great to mm -hmm. share them with you. Far away, but feeling very close, I think, to our hearts and to our minds. So, um, you know, just been a great conversation. I think I can say on behalf of Marjorie Hans, um, we hope to see you in person uh, mm -hmm. in the future. But hey, this will this will definitely do for now. Thank you very much, Audrey, for your time. Thank you very really much. Live long, prosper. Okay. Yeah. Bye. 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 <laughs>